imagine it's November 1860. You are a citizen of the United States. You live in a southern state like Virginia, South Carolina, or Georgia. The country has been divided for years on certain political issues. Abraham Lincoln has just won the election for President of the United States, and your state decides to leave the Union. Months later, word comes that war has started in Charleston, South Carolina. You hit your knees and cry out to God to protect your family and your home. I've been researching American history for years. Oftentimes, I wonder how our predecessors often felt about God and religion during specific periods in history. In recent years, I've turned my attention to studying more about the war between the states. During my research, I keep seeing the faith and religion of well-known historical figures that lived during the struggle. So I wanted to share with the rest of you what I found. Faith in God and religion has been seen throughout our country's history. However, the men of the Civil War demonstrated in their daily lives on and off the battlefield a very deep faith and conviction. Their belief in God was used in decisions that they had to make and was seen in how they live. I'd like to talk to you about the faith of some very well-known generals. Days of, prayer, days of national prayer that was called for by Davis and Lincoln, and revivals that took place in the Confederate camps. Probably one of the most famous generals of all time is Thomas Stonewall Jackson. According to an article in Christianity Today written by Jeffrey Warren Scott, though born an Episcopalian, Jackson became a Presbyterian, and he was a noted tither to his home church. The Jackson family held prayers at 7 a.m., and even servants were required to attend. Jackson never waited for anyone, not even his wife, to begin prayers. Following breakfast, Jackson would leave for his teaching duties at Virginia Military Institute. When he would return home for Bible study, he did so using a commentary. On the battlefield, Stonewall Jackson maintained his devotional life. He was often seen by his troops <coughs> tripping or stumbling over rocks or trees and they would think he was drunk. He was actually walking around with his eyes closed because he was praying. He would often declare, my religious belief teaches me to feel as safe in battle as in bed. God has fixed the time of my death. After accidentally being shot by his own troops, he died on May 10, 1863. He often said, I always wanted to die on a Sunday. Robert E. Lee, the commander of the Army of Virginia was a man of great faith. His favorite hymn was How Firm a Foundation and was actually played at his funeral. Dr. David Martin made the following statement about Lee. General Robert E. Lee was a Christian man and not ashamed of his Savior or the Bible. What if everybody lived like General Lee? Then everybody would be God-fearing, born again, Bible-believing, lowly-minded, church-going, soul-winning, and clean-living what if you lived like General Lee? Lee didn't drink, smoke, curse, or tell crude jokes. One story goes that a soldier asked if there was any ladies present before he told an off-color joke. Lee was quoted as saying, there are no ladies present, but there is one gentleman present. The joke was never told. Goodreads takes from Lee's recollections two quotes that I strongly feel summarizes Lee's faith. The first one describes himself. I can only say I am nothing but a poor sinner trusting in Christ alone for salvation. The second one is about the Bible. In all my perplexities and distresses, the Bible has never failed to give me light and strength. Just one more little not known well fact about Robert E. Lee. He was asked by presidential advisor Francis Blair to form an army in the defense of Washington. Mr. Blair, I look upon succession as our anarchy. If I owned the four millions of slaves in the South, I would sacrifice them all to the Union. But how can I draw my sword upon Virginia, my native state? Lee was a man of God, home, and family. Now let us turn our attention to a Union general, George McClellan. McClellan, as a general, did not have a very good reputation. He would often overestimate the power of the South or was slow to attack and he didn't hold his command very long because of that. However, he was a very religious man. According to an article in Christianity Today that I referred to earlier, the following was said about McClellan. The Union has just suffered a great defeat at the first battle of Bull Run. 
Some people said the Union was defeated because federal troops attacked on the Sunday morning, dishonoring the Sabbath. McClellan agreed and he ordered that the Sabbath be observed throughout the Union Army with services held whenever military demands did not absolutely prevent worship and rest. He was forced to give up his command after a year to Burnside. He would run against Lincoln in 1864, and as we all know, he would lost that bid for the presidency. William Rosencrans was another Union general who demonstrated his faith in God. The article in Christianity Today describes Rosencrans as a staunch Catholic who would not fight on a Sunday. He was criticized for not pursuing General Braxton Bragg's army because it was a Sunday. He increased the numbers of chaplains in his company and he would engage his staff in religious discussions, sometimes keeping them up to 4 a.m. in the mornings for several evenings. He attended Mass very regularly and he was quoted as saying, God never fails those who truly trust. Now I'd like to discuss the National Days of Prayer that was ordered by both Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln. In the book, Onward Southern Soldiers, the author stated the following. Davis maintained that God had devolved a high and holy responsibility on the Confederacy, entrusting them to preserve the constitutional liberty of a free government. Davis admitted that the Confederates would have to make some big sacrifices in carrying out the charge placed upon the South. But he contended that under the smiles of the just, the Confederacy would be endowed with the spirits of the Founding Fathers and would achieve great success. He prayed with hope that the Confederacy would pray that God had blessed the Confederacy's cause and country with success and victory. During the history of the Confederacy, Davis called for nine days of what he called a day for humiliation, fasting, and prayer. The Confederacy only lasted four years, so it essentially had a little over two days of national prayer a year. According to an article in Christian Union, Abraham Lincoln, probably one of the presidents most well known for not having any religious leanings and did not belong to an organized church, called for a National Day of Humiliation, Fasting, and Prayer on March 30, 1863. Let us then rest humbly in the hope authorized by the divine teachings that the united cry of the nation will be heard on high and answered with blessings no less than the pardon of our national sins and the restoration of our now divided and suffering country to its former happy condition of unity and peace. He asked the people to abstain on that day from their ordinary secular pursuits and to unite at their several places of public worship and their respective homes in keeping the day holy to the Lord and devoted to the humble discharge of the religious duties proper to that solemn occasion. Revival took place in the Confederate Army in 1863 and 1864. Masses of men came forward to profess Jesus as their Savior to be baptized. It was estimated that 7,000 men were converted. In an article in the magazine put out by the Christian History Institute, even Confederate commanders came forward in this period to accept the Christian faith. General John Bell Hood, crippled by multiple battlefield wounds, was baptized in the fall of 1864. Henry Lay, Episcopalian Bishop of Arkansas, described the scene. Hood, unable to kneel, supported himself on his crutch and staff, and with bowed head received the benediction. With precious little less, Southern soldiers sought spiritual strength from their religious experience. So as you can see, the men who fought in one of the greatest struggles of our country were very religious men who lived with conviction. Faith in God was demonstrated by commanding generals when the presidents of both the Confederacy and the Union called for national days of prayer and by the great revival that took place in the Confederate Army. The men who took part in between the war of states showed faith and conviction to their lives on and off the battlefield. I'm thankful to live in a country where our forefathers sought to give us freedom to worship the living God. I hope this gives y'all a better understanding of what took place during this war between brothers.